स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू टूडेज लेक्चर इन लास्ट लेक्चर वी डिस्कस्ड अबाउट वन एप्लीकेशन ऑफ एंगुलर मोमेंटम ऑपरेटर एंड द प्रॉब्लम वॉज पार्टिकुलर ने रिंग टूडे वी वुड एक्सटेंड आवर डिस्कशन to another problem which is particle and a sphere there is a close relation between the the two problem that is particle and a ring and particle and a sphere is that when you imagine that you are stacking a number of rings above each other then you can imagine to construct a sphere in this way and while the particle is in a ring the particle was particle's movement was restricted to one xy plane where the z axis was non operational because for a fixed value of z the particle was moving along the around the xy plane in a circular path but on a particle in a sphere problem not only the particle can go along around the xy plane that is particle in a ring but now the particle can also move from one ring so as so to speak one ring to another ring that means in this case particle in a sphere we have all three cartesian axes x y and z all three are operational or active so now we would try to find the quantum mechanical solution of a particle of mass m which is moving on a sphere of suppose radius r to solve this problem quantum mechanically we know we would start with the by writing down the hamiltonian of the system so the hamiltonian would have two terms one the kinetic energy operator the potential energy operator and just like the particle in a ring problem we would make this in this case the potential energy term is zero that means the particle while moving on the sphere does not exp and experience any other interaction with any other particle so therefore its hamiltonian is completely given by the kinetic energy operator now in this case since the particle is moving around the uh, on a sphere so all x all three cartesian coordinates are operational so therefore i see i write down the hamiltonian as minus a square by 2m d square by dx square plus d square by dy square plus t square by dz square so please note here all the derivatives are uh, partial derivative this because i have the the particle is moving uh, can move uh, over all all over the sphere so where x y z are variables will simultaneously get changed so this kinetic energy operator would have been just adequate if we were discussing particle in a, in a, in a cube or uh, or a cuboid however since we are discussing uh, where the particle is moving on a sphere so you would like to convert this uh, kinetic energy operator from cartesian coordinate to spherical uh, coordinate but before that we when you look at this term uh, we there is a shorthand way to represent this and this is called as uh, del square so this is upside down a delta or upside down triangle so this is given as either del this the symbol or also known as nabla this operator remember this is actually an operator uh, with second derivative with respect to x y and z so this operator is known as laplacian so laplacian in cartesian uh, coordinates is simply given by uh, this term now what we do is that we would re recall how we defined our uh, spherical uh, coordinate in spherical coordinates we had x y and z defined in terms of r theta and phi variables so x y z are the cartesian coordinates r theta and phi are the spherical coordinates so this is when i replace when i try to rewrite this laplacian instead of uh, cartesian coordinate when i try to write it in in terms of spher in spherical coordinate this is what i would get this uh, long term when you see it has some second derivative with respect to r term 
some derivative with respect to phi, some derivative differentiation with respect to theta. So, all three uh, angular coordinates are present here. I can when I look closely I would see that the first term has only r terms in it, the second and third terms have all r theta and phi. However, one important observation is that in the second and third term this 1 over r square is simply multiplied here and in both the terms I have 1 over r square. So, I can separate this 1 over r square and then I look at the terms which have only theta and phi dependence. When I look at this term theta which have only theta and phi dependence, I define a smaller name for this and I call this term as lambda square or I call that as a Legendrian. So, I have Laplacian which has which has x which is defined in along x, y, z coordinates and I can write this Laplacian in, in the spherical co coordinates uh, where r, theta and phi all are present. Additionally, I can define another operator that is Legendrian which has only angular dependence. Note here lambda square or the Legendrian will have only differentiation with respect to phi or differentiation with respect to theta terms. So, 1 over r square lambda square is the second term and I have this first term. So, I simplified this Laplacian to, to this form when and I can now replace this Laplacian in my Hamiltonian over here, but before I, I do that I look at this the first term. The first term in this uh, Laplacian in spherical coordinate suggests that I have to take a double differentiation with respect to r. What is r? r in this case is the radius of the sphere. Since my particle is going on a sphere, so therefore I, I know what is the value of the, the radius of the sphere, so therefore for a problem r is constant because I am defining that my particle is moving on a sphere of radius r. Since r in this problem is a, is a constant, so therefore this term, the first term in this Laplacian would not have any contribution, so therefore we can ignore this term. When we ignore that, we are, we are left with this uh, second term alone and we will use this to define our Hamiltonian which is now minus h square divided by 2 m and now Laplacian is given by 1 over r square and Legendrian or I can simplify this as h square divided by 2 i where i is m r square the moment of inertia Laplacian uh, excuse me Legendrian. So, this is how the Hamiltonian is now defined in terms of Legendrian. So, just to uh, remind you, so I started with my Hamiltonian where I had, with, I had kinetic energy and potential energy operator. I said that the part particle on a sphere does not experience any external potential. So, therefore, V is 0 and my Hamiltonian has only kinetic energy operator and I wrote down the kinetic energy term uh, operator in Cartesian coordinate. I introduced something called Laplacian operator and Laplacian operator when I express in, in terms of spherical coordinate, I say there is a radial term and then there is Legendrian. So, the radial term is inactive here because I am talking about a sphere of a fixed radius. So, therefore, I am left with only the Legendrian term in this. So, at the end I have defined my Hamiltonian in terms of the Legendrian. What advantage do I get here? The nice thing about this Legendrian operator is that if you compare this Legendrian operator to another operator that we have introduced that is L square operator, then you would see that then you would see that L square is simply minus h bar square and Legendrian. So, you would see that L square is minus h bar square and uh, multiplied by the Legendrian. So, therefore, if I uh, rewrite my Hamiltonian now instead of using the Legendrian minus h bar square, I simply have L, L square. So, now you see what I have achieved is that I have expressed my Hamiltonian in, ter in terms of L square operator and a constant because for a given problem mass of the particle is known, radius of the sphere is known. So, therefore, 2 i is a constant. So, my Hamiltonian operator is expressed in terms of angular square of angular momentum operator L square operator. What advantage do I have here? 
the advantage that I get here is that since I know, since I have spent some time in discussing what are the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of this L square operator, now the Hamiltonian is simply L square operator multiplied by a constant. So, therefore, the eigenfunction of L square operator are also going to be the eigenfunction of Hamiltonian. So, remember uh, we are trying to find out the pro solution of this Hamiltonian that is the uh, H psi equals E psi. We are interested in looking for the eigenfunction and the eigenvalues corresponding to this Hamiltonian. But now we see that this Hamiltonian can be expressed in terms of L square operator and we know L square operator and its eigenfunctions. What are its eigenfunctions? Its eigenfunctions are the well known spherical harmonics where I have, I have psi L m and you see they have de they depend on theta and phi coordinate and the eigenvalue corresponding to uh, this eigen the spherical harmonics for L square operator is simply L into L plus 1 h bar square so i know the eigen functions of L square operator and now i would use this relation in the uh, schrodinger equation for the uh, hamiltonian uh, operator so in in place of Hamiltonian, I have L square operator divided by 2 i. So, psi L m are again the eigenfunction of Hamiltonian operator because in this case you can see that um, I, I can use the eigenfunction of L square operator as the eigenfunction of Hamiltonian operator. So, when I look at here the right hand side. So, now this is my Hamiltonian H psi E psi where the energy is given here. So, here E the energy of course, since I have L or M dependence. This is my energy. You see the energy expression does not have explicit dependence on M but I know for a given value of L, I can have 2 L plus 1 number of M values. This is, this is the general solution that I got from the uh, uh, quantum mechanical solution of angular momentum operator. Now, these are now the part energy of the particle in a, on a sphere. What are the possible values of L? So, L can have values 0, 1, 2 and so on so forth. When L is 0, you would say m, m has only one possible value that is a 0 0 and since L is 0 the lowest energy is 0 and this is 0 point energy. Like particle in a ring the particle in a sphere also has the lowest energy or 0 point energy as 0. This would again indicate that the particle is at rest or it is not moving when it is at the lowest energy level or that is the 0 point energy level. The next one will be when L is 1. In that case, there I can have 3 different values of m. m. So, there can be plus 1 or minus 1 or 0. So, in, in that case, the energy since if I put L is, L is 1. So, I simply have 2 h square uh, divided by 2 i and this will be 3 fold degenerate. Generate. Similarly, when I put L is 2, E 2 for L equals 2, I have 5 different values of m from minus 2 to plus 2 in the step of 1 and when L is 2, I have 6 s square divided by 2 i and this energy level will be 5 fold degenerate. So, in particle in a ring problem, we saw that except for the lowest energy level that is the 0 point energy level whose energy was 0, all other eigenfunctions were two fold degenerate. That, is, that means, two eigenfunctions would have same eigenvalue. 
for all non-zero value of m. In this case, in particle and a sphere problem, we see that the lowest energy again has zero uh, as energy of zero. That means the zero point energy is zero in uh, like uh, in particle and a sphere. But all other higher energies would have energy levels would uh, would have different levels of degeneracy. The the second level has threefold degeneracy. The third level has fivefold degeneracy. This is because the Hamiltonian can be expressed in terms of L square and now in this by, by expressing the Hamiltonian in terms of L square, we could use the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues of L square operator as the eigenfunction and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian operator. So, this way the solution of particle and a sphere became very easy. That is because we have already invested a lot of time in discussing the solution of angular momentum operator L square. So far, all our systems that we have discussed whether it is particle in a box or a harmonic oscillator or, or a particle in a ring or particle in a sphere, we have always discussed one particle. But we know in molecular systems that we uh, would be interested in chemistry, we would have more than one particle uh, to, to worry about. So, now we would extend our discussion from one particle to two particle system and in that case, uh, how the quantum mechanical solution changes that is that will be the topic of our discussion next. We would now discuss the, the internal motion of a two body system. Suppose I define uh, a two body system with mass m 1 and mass m 2 mass m 1 occupies the Cartesian space of x 1 y 1 z 1, m 2 occupies the space x 2 y 2 z 2. I can define the position uh, of this mass 1 and mass 2 in terms of two position vectors r 1 and r 2 and the vector connecting mass 1 and uh, mass 2 uh, is, is defined by this another displacement vector r. I can define my r vector as from simple uh, vector algebra as r 2 vector minus r 1 vector. So, therefore, the, the position vector of uh, corresponding to this r vector is given by this relation where x 1, x 2, x 1, y 1, z 1 and x 2, y 2, z 2 are the Cartesian uh, coordinates of mass 1 and mass 2. When I have two masses m 1 and m 2 here, I can always define the center of mass of this two body problem. Suppose, I have the center of mass of this m 1 m 2 two body problem is situated at this place and I can define a position vector of corresponding to that center of mass with a capital R. Here, this capital R vector is given by in terms of the masses of the two uh, systems and also their uh, displacement uh, position vectors r 1 and r 2. This is general definition uh, that we have obtained from, uh, from normal vector algebra uh, analysis. So, we have now this r vector which is the position vector of the center of mass of the system where r is given in terms of m 1, m 2 and r 1 and r 2. That makes sense because if I change the mass of the two particles, the center of mass would change. If I change the position of the two particles, the center of mass would change. So, therefore, the center of mass should actually depend on m 1, m 2 r 1, r 2. The individual Cartesian coordinates of this uh, center of mass can be given in terms of these relations. They are very similar to the uh, overall uh, the vector representation that is shown here. Alternatively, what I can we have now if you see that I defined started defining my problem in terms of two bodies with two vectors r 1 and r 2. Now, I have defined another two vector other two vectors capital and r, r and small r. The capital r is the uh, position vector corresponding to the, the center of mass of the system and the small r vector is actually the distance between the m 1 and m 2, the vector representing the dis distance between m 1 and m 2. So, I am I have what I have done is that I have expressed r 1 vector and r 2 vector in, in terms of the capital R vector and small r vector. 
So, I started defining R1 vector, uh, so I started defining the system, the two body system in terms of R1 and R2 and now I know that I can define this R1 and R2 in terms of this capital R and small r. So, I have two different ways of describing the system, one in terms of R1 and R2, another is small r and uh, cap, small r and capital R. No matter how I define my system, I can always write down the corresponding kinetic energy of the system in these two ways. The first line, so this is the kind shows the kinetic energy of the system where half m1 v1 square, half m2 v2 square. So, r1 dot simply indicates the time derivative of the position uh, vector correspond for particle m1. So, this is the kind sum of the two kinetic energy of the two the, the two particles of mass m1 and m2. Alternatively, I can define now the kinetic energy of the system instead of using m1 and m2, r1 and r2, I am I have defined two different terms. One term is with respect to the capital R. So, this is time derivative of the uh, center of mass and this is the time derivative of the internal distance between the two uh, masses m1, m2, where the capital M is simply m1 plus m2 and the small uh, the mu is the reduced mass of the system given by m1, m2 divided by m1 plus m2. So, now there are two different ways of expressing my kinetic energy. The advantage of the second approach is that I can now see that in the, the first line, I see that the, the movement of the system is defined by two vectors which are uh, R1 and R2, but on the second, uh, second line, I see that I have expressed this kinetic energy operator in terms of two variables which actually can be separated. How? Because the first term represents an overall translational motion of the center of mass, whereas the second term talks about the internal motion of this two body system. The internal motion of the two body system will be reflected by this small r when the distance of the two masses for example, when they change. So, this small r indicates the internal motion of the system which can be when the particle is when the body two body is rotating or when the two body is vibrating. On the other hand, the first term represents the overall translational motion of this two body uh, system. So, I can separate this two body problem to two one body problem, where the first one body problem is essentially the translational motion of the center of uh, translational motion of a fictitious particle of mass m1 plus m2 at the center of mass of the system and the second problem is the internal motion. The second problem has this kinetic energy term and suppose I introduce some external potential that would influence the rotation or the vibration of this uh, two body uh, system. In that case, that term the potential term can be inc incorporated into the Hamiltonian like you have kinetic energy and the potential energy and overall I can solve the Schrodinger equation. Translational motion and the internal motion can be solved separately. I need not worry about this translational motion because if you look carefully, this resembles the particle in a box type of problem. So, I know its solution. So, I would be more interested in solving the problem like this. The application of this discussion is that when we have two body system, I can decouple this two body system into two effective one body pro problems. The one is the overall translational motion of the center of mass, the other is the internal motion. I would ignore the overall translational motion and focus on the internal motion and this is what we are going to do for the next problem that is rigid rotor. Rigid rotor is defined as a, as a two body problem where the masses of the two uh, uh, the two masses are actually fixed in their, uh, uh, the, the distance between m1 and m2 is fixed. This is a rotor which can go uh, rotate, but while rotating it is not allowed to change its uh, internal motion uh, r. So, the distance is, is frozen. So, for such a system I can uh, write down the uh, Hamiltonian. So, I would like to solve this problem quantum mechanically. So, 
I have the Hamiltonian as T plus V again the kinetic energy operator plus the potential energy operator and I would say I would say that again I would assume that there exists no external potential. So, therefore, the Hamiltonian is uh, simply the kinetic energy operator and, and in this case the kinetic energy operator uh, is can be defined as where this is I know this is Laplacian. Now, you see I am using the reduced mass because I am talking about the internal motion of the, the problem. So, I have this uh, Laplacian here and I know if you remember uh, I have the Laplacian which can be expressed in of a radial term and a uh, and a Lysentrian term we just discussed this and in this case uh, to the first term the radial term has the differentiation with respect to r. But since we have defined that our rigid rotor is rigid that means the distance between the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the length of this body is not going to change. So, therefore, this term will not contribute. So, I can ignore this. So, like the particle in a on a sphere problem I have this where I replaced my Laplacian in terms of the Lysentrian and I can simplify this by using minus L bar squared uh, Lysentrian as L square divided by sorry this minus H square bar H bar square Lysentrian is L square. So, this minus sign is not there and I define it as 2 i. So, now my Hamiltonian is again expressed in terms of L square and I would be immediately able to uh, solve this problem because I know the solution of this problem. I know the solution of the uh, L square operator they are the spherical harmonics. So, therefore, Hamiltonian will also have uh, the same spherical harmonics as the solution. So, where I these are spherical harmonics please note instead of uh, using L conventionally one uses J. So, I am uh, so that you are familiar with this notation where the energy is simply h square divided by 2 i j into j plus 1. And this h square by 2 i h bar is a constant 2 i is a constant for the problem and we give this is a uh, small name and we call that it is a rotational constant and, uh, and it depends on the mass of the particle mass of the uh, uh, reduced mass of the system and the length of the uh, rigid rotor. And j goes from 0 to 1 to 2, 0, 1, 2 and so on and so forth. So, in this way we can actually get the energy levels of the rigid rotor. So, again if I use j as 0, the energy is 0. When j is 1, I have 2 b as the energy. When j is 2, E 2 is 2 into 3, 6 b and so on and so forth. So, this way we also dis obtain the eigenvalues of the rigid rotor problem. So, in today's lecture we looked at two different applications of angular momentum operator. We saw particle in a sphere and rigid rotor. In both cases when we wanted to solve this problem quantum mechanically, we reduced the problem the Hamiltonian to the L square operator and we use the eigen function of L square operator and the eigen values of the L square operator to define the energy levels of particle in a sphere as well as rigid rotor. We would come back to this rigid rotor solution when we are discussing the rotational spectroscopy in, in molecules. Thank you for your attention.